because these individuals were not allowed to actually see blue, green, yellow, beige, purple, et cetera, there was very little stimulation to the brain to actually keep the electromagnetic circuitry working to stimulate the cells to communicate to one another, which is what produces intelligence. So that's why they have found that when we look at the psychology of colors, that when we use pastel colors or muted colors, they automatically allow the person to think less. So we call that relaxing because there's very little light or stimulation related to the brain, and so therefore it allows us to basically not appear alert and have to be stimulated to think about making a decision about anything or absorbing it. So that's why in the doctor's offices now who are really into making your visit painless and relaxing, they will have very pale grays, very pale lavenders, et cetera, to actually decrease the stimulation to your brain because now they're actually cutting out full light spectrum so that you can actually go into a state really of what I call kind of intellectual retardation because it's a form of actual, actual uh, malnourishment from the lack of light. There is a gentleman that has done a tremendous amount of research with light exposure and health. His name is John Ott and he recognized that irregardless of what race you are, you have to be exposed to a certain amount of light to be able to stay healthy, to maintain a healthy immune system, and most of all, to actually remain intelligent. And this gentleman was a uh, Caucasian, and I thought it was very interesting that he even joined with MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, doing studies with lower animals to prove that you could actually determine the reproductive capacity of an animal. You could determine the sex that the animal was able to reproduce. You could determine the intelligence. You could determine the health of an individual just by manipulating the light intensity and the colors that the animal was exposed to. So it was very interesting. They decided to do some research with um, chinchillas and minks because it happened to be a farmer who uh, was having some problems maintaining his meek and chinchillas because only females were being born into the litter. And so therefore there were no males being born so he could not continue his litters. And so he didn't know whether it was in the feed or what the problem was. Well, John Ott went there and recognized that the frequency of the lights in the pens was adverse to stimulating the production of male species, means and chinchillas. Now, there's a book that has just come out by a gentleman by the name of uh, Leahy, if I'm not mistaken. And the name of the book is Sex and the Brain. And what this gentleman has actually identified is, that he was a, he's a pathologist, is that as he looked at the brains that were coming through his laboratory, he recognized that all brains are female. And research now is showing that if a developing fetus who is destined to be male is not exposed to testosterone in the uterus two to three weeks prior to birth, and then again two to three months after birth, that this individual will have problems having an affinity toward the opposite sex or complete male development. Now, I thought that was very interesting, and this person has really been bombarded on TV in relationship to dealing with uh, the propensity for bisexual, heterosexual activity. We have a problem with that now with many people having sexual identity issues. And with the advent of being exposed to more radiation, more laser rays, Mothers are cooking food now with microwave ovens. We're being exposed to all kinds of unnatural lights, and all different spectrums of uh, lighting in our home, that it appears that this is probably going to be identified as one of the major problems that is happening to the mothers during the gestational period that they are being either bombarded with abnormal frequencies of light or that they are not actually receiving enough light, and this is actually a problem. 
we are already noticing that women who are working eight to 10 hours a day and doing close eye work, that is if they're reading a lot, automatically and naturally will produce female children almost nine to one as opposed to male children. We're also noticing that women who are exposing cells again to very high frequencies of radiation from computers or that they're working with microwaves, etc. their children are born with a greater risk of mutations, hernias, a lot of other things. So I'm very concerned about this in the melanin dominant community and those individuals who have outright melanin must become aware of what does it mean when they are actually walking into a field of microwave. Many times you go places and there's a sign that says, you know, don't enter if you have a pacemaker, okay, because this is a high microwave field. What does that mean if you are actually jet black and you're in that field? Not that you have a pacemaker, but actually how does that affect the melanin molecule? If you are melanin recessive, how does that actually affect you? Because now we're finding out that these high frequencies of light, and when I say high frequencies of light, I'm talking about those frequencies of light that we normally cannot perceive or see unless it's reflected back to us through a machine. Okay, you have to understand what I'm saying. For example, most people do not know that they are being exposed to uh, ultraviolet radiation unless it is being measured by a machine or it's being actually reflected back to you through some type of instrument. You don't know that you're in a field of radio waves unless you actually have a radio there that can actually reflect that back to you. Now, some of the interesting things that are happening that we're finding out about melanin when we look back at many of the hieroglyphs, many of the codices in Mexico, and many of the ancient writings in Africa, is that people were always able to communicate with each other mentally and be able to talk to each other verbally and be able to play musical instruments by drums and communicate hundreds and hundreds of miles away. Now we are also noticing and we also are aware of the fact that radio waves can be perceived by any individual that is sensitive to these waves that is melanin dominant. And this is one of the things that Frances Press Welsing talks about when she talks about the Dogon people and their capacity to have used the stars in the sky as designs for their clothing, to paint the outside of their uh, huts, etc., because they were walking X-ray films. Now, what does that mean? If any of you are astronomers, you know that there's getting ready to uh, be an experience of an interesting phenomenon that hasn't happened for millions of years. That is, that there are bodies that are going to collide with Jupiter, okay, next month, starting the 16th or so, okay, that are gonna have a profound effect on this planet. These meteorites, there's gonna be a meteorite shower that will be hitting Jupiter that will be felt definitely upon Earth. Now, these meteorites and other star systems can be identified, and there's now all kind of thousands of volumes of star charts available in the planetariums because of radio wave x-rays. So what happens is that they have particular x-ray plates that are sensitive to radio waves that they expose through a telescope pointed in a direction where they suspect there is a star. The long wave radio waves bombard the plate because it is a form of light, expose it, and then they develop the plate and then calculate the amount of light there based on star years to determine how far the star is away, how big it is, etc. Now, as I said, melanin is the physical manifestation of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So that means that wherever you are, any light that is like you, your melanin is going to be able to pick that up and relay it to your brain because every granule of melanin